Hello, sales leaders. Welcome back to another episode of the SaaS Sales Performance Podcast. Now, today we are continuing our enablement series, and I've been speaking with some fantastic, passionate enablement leaders from all the way across the globe. Um, my guest today is, is one of those. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined by the Global Head of Enablement at Mambu, which is a fintech business that's on a super fast, rapid scaling journey of its own. Um, thrilled to be joined by, by Dennis. Um, Dennis, welcome uh, to the show. It's, it's great to have you on and really looking forward to, to having a conversation today. Thank you very much, Matt. I'm looking forward to it as well. Happy to be here. So Dennis, you're joining us from the Netherlands. Um, that's correct yes we can yeah we can hear some some of your your, your dutch accent there is uh, is oh. coming through i mean sorry for that sorry for that it's it, it's i personally love it it's one of my favorite favorite <laughs> accents um but dennis for those listening to the show who perhaps haven't come across um you and your your background um or mambu i mean i'd like to just kick off by i always ask this question like what is your story and how did you end up in uh, the wonderful world of enablement. Yeah, okay, thank you, Matt. Yeah, my story, so I'm uh, 54 years old, so I have a like a 30 years background experience in selling and sales and sales management. Uh, in between, I've had uh, my own company for a, a short while, a couple of years, but the, 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 the common denominator has always been uh, sales and, uh, and, and a bit of sales management. So my story is I, uh, I grew up uh, and after college, I joined a company called HP back in the days, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and uh, I, I began basically in an administrative um, uh, sales role. Uh, and that's at some point after, after a couple of years when it hit me, it was like, okay, sales is my future. I'm a commercial guy and I want to develop myself in, in into sales. And I just had that feeling that sales is something so exciting. Sales is a profession that is so incredibly diverse and rich in, in skill sets and knowledge that you need. Uh, that's that's what I loved about sales. And obviously the kickoff at the end of the day, doing the business selling or closing the deal, that's also a nice, uh, a nice phenomenon in sales. So yeah, so I grew my career. I moved to other companies and at some point um, I became a global account manager uh, for um, two large banks in uh, well, global banks, but Dutch based, ABN AMRO and ING. And I kind of at that at that time it was like I was like 35, 36. I felt the need to. I was successful in sales, very successful. I felt the need. It began to develop where I said, okay, I'd like to share my experience and expertise and knowledge with others. So I moved into sales management. Uh, at some point in time, the company that I worked for at the time was uh, acquired uh, um, by a diff by another company. And I had the opportunity to move into sales management and uh, under the expectation that I was going to be able to do that, um, coach people, help people become better in their job, my team basically. And I did that, but at the same time, I also felt a lot of pressure from a, a traditional company, like the company I worked for at the time on the numbers, uh, traditional pressure on creating spreadsheets, working in a matrix company, a matrix organization, which was kind of hard. It was not really my cup of tea, so to speak. It was not something that I was actually uh, extremely good at, but also interested in. It didn't enlighten my passion, so to speak. So I moved on and uh, I had my own company, an advisory company for end users on IT, uh, acquiring, purchasing IT technology. Um, at some point I was an IT manager, so uh, for an, uh, an hospital in the Netherlands, um, crazy how things can go. And, uh, and then I moved on in sales and eventually um, I got back into corporate world, um, had another sales management job. Uh, this time it went a bit better. I was more mature. I was more grown up, so to speak. I kind of took uh, uh, the opportunity to deal with it in a better way. But eventually knowing that it was not completely uh, my thing. So, and that's when I joined a company called Oracle. And in Oracle, I had a sales executive business development role. And, and, and at some point I was given the opportunity to build a sales enablement function for a, a sales organization within Oracle. 
um, uh, called Oracle Digital, which was and still is the inside sales or let's say the SMB sales, uh, digital sales organization for Oracle in EMEA. So that's how my enablement journey started. Incredible. And we'll, we'll come on to talk about Mambu um, in just a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Dennis, one of the things I'm, I'm always fascinated by is, you know, when, when as sales professionals, we make that first leap into a leadership role. I mean, you mm -hmm. just, you've just shared there yourself, you know, the first time around, you know, perhaps wasn't the right time. Um, what do you think was the difference when you came back to sales, sales leadership and the second time around being a sales manager? What, what were some of the skills or competencies that you think you had developed that made it successful second time around? Yeah, the, the, the second time, um, what was different was in, in, in the first time, normally when, when it, the first time you uh, enter a sales management role, you, um, uh, you, you come into a situation where you were one of the best sales reps, right? So that's typically the reason why they promote you and, and why you want that role in the first place. Hey, I've been so good in selling. Again, why, what I thought as well, let, let me help others. Uh, let me coach others. Let me be there for them and build my team um, and there's also a personal thing right when it comes to hey the title or the job well it's definitely not about making money because i made more money in my individual sales role <laughs> than i made in sales management because it's typically hard to uh overachieve on a country number or a regional number um but the, the second time it was more of i in the company i joined it was hp again at the time the company I joined uh, again for the second time then HP. Um, I had no history there in selling. Yeah, it was a long time ago in a different kind of part of the business. So I didn't land in that job from a specific direct sales job from within that company. That made a difference. Secondly, my skill set was grown. I, like I said, I was more mature, more grown up. So I wasn't fighting every specific element that I was faced with, like matrix, uh, matrix organization, people demanding things from me. I was kind of better in going with the flow, accepting that I knew it was important for them that that specific document was supposed to be released or created. So that was better. And thirdly, um, it was a different situation, a bigger team um, and a different product set. And the, the, the HP at the time uh, was in the area that I was responsible for also market leading so there was also a bit of difference what i would say but the most the, the biggest chunk is a more mature way of dealing with the ins and outs of the company and the stakeholders super interesting and it, it sounds like you developed a lot more emotional intelligence um, exactly during... yeah yeah yeah, and it's also, I mean, the biggest thing you have to understand, if you move into a sales leader role, especially when you come from a sales, from, from uh, when you are extremely successful in selling, right? The biggest mindset change is that you, suddenly you have to realize that you can't do everything by yourself anymore, right? So it's what Simon Sinek says, you're as a sales leader, then you're responsible for the people, who are responsible for the numbers. You're not responsible for the numbers yourself anymore. We think we are, and to a certain extent we are, but somebody else has to do it. Now, when you do not adopt that mindset shift, you tend to think, okay, I need to bring in the numbers. But then again, others, your people, your, your, your ICs, they need to do it, which means in, in, in often sales leaders are forced, they're forcing themselves or they're forced by the company, by their senior leadership to move into a directive style of management, saying what to do. Hey, I've been there too myself, so I know what to do. So I'm telling you, do this. Now, obviously, that is not a trait of leadership, right? So um, it is all connected and there's all a, a consequence of, of, of things, but the mindset shift is really important, right? So you have to understand that you are not responsible for doing it yourself anymore. Um, you may be accountable, but not responsible. The people in your team are. That's a very big difference. And um, yeah, I had to learn that too. Yeah, and I, I'm going on that journey myself, you know, at being learning how to let go as a founder of, of certain things and move away from directive to supportive leadership and you know being more of a coach and, and an enabler exactly. as opposed to 
it's it's super fascinating. And then I, I guess, Dennis, you're now at Mambu. I mean, it's yeah. a really exciting journey to be a part of. I mean, for those listening, you know, Mambu, uh, from what I've got to learn about the business, are essentially helping um, majority of the world's large banks move to the cloud, right? And um, yeah, there it's a really interesting space to be in right now with all the pressure that the banks are under from challenger banks, and uh, you're helping the the bigger guys innovate, right? Yeah, that's true. So I got the opportunity to join Mambo. Uh, I left Oracle because I felt at some point in my enablement role within that specific business unit or, or sales unit of, of Oracle, I did not have the opportunity to give enough of what I tip, what I really stand for. I had no opportunity to make a difference because the company was sort of moving in a well semi in a different direction. And it was too big, too massive, too difficult to overcome. I couldn't access a senior, senior leadership. So, and I felt enablement is really all about, we'll get to that in a minute, enablement. For, for, for modern sales enablement, you really need executive uh, leadership engagement, right? So you need sales leaders to be part of your journey because otherwise it's really difficult um, to work with sales reps, sales managers, first line managers, and, and, and all sales supporting staff if senior leadership doesn't adopt the same principles, right? Because you need to build a narrative. Modern sales enablement is really about building a narrative. We'll get to that in a minute, I think. So I couldn't, uh, I did not have the opportunity and uh, Mambu uh, uh, came in and, and yeah, I, I, I love their approach, uh, uh, Elliot Limp, CCO, and uh, and Scott Wilson, my VP growth and VP go to market. They love my vision. So uh, and I love uh, Mambu for the fact that what we're doing, which is basically empowering people with better access to financial services so that they uh, live a better life uh, or do something good for the world, uh, which is actually that's our mission. And I love that idea. Uh, scale up um, uh, 10 years ago, founded. So there is something, there is actually a lot already. We have an amazing set of customers and clients and uh, we serve approximately 50 million end user consumers. So basically users of clients of the banks that we serve, that we work with. And we have a fantastic technology and an incredibly talented team. So yeah, I got the opportunity to join and, and, and make, um, well, build an enablement organization from the ground up. There's nothing. So, um, yeah, that that that's an uh, that's an amazing opportunity that they gave me. So, love that. I'm really keen to to hear more about that vision, Dennis. Um, I mean, the typical evolution that that we see in the market is the founders get the business to a certain level of of traction in the market, um, with very little in the way of kind of people process or or structure. Um, the first senior sales hire then typically comes in to help them get to the to the next level, be it Series A or or beyond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there then comes a moment in time when the sales org has scaled to a sufficient size, be it five reps, ten reps, um, when they suddenly realise that they just don't have enough time to focus on enabling the team. Yeah. And and that's usually the moment where they need some some either external support or they make that enablement hire. I mean, talk us through that journey at Mambu and, and what was the, what's the vision that you've, you've brought into that role since you've been yeah. here? Yeah, well, firstly, the, the, a lot of companies struggle with that principle, right? So, hey, you were founded for a beautiful reason, a belief that, hey, we're, we're going to change the world to a certain extent where we're, we're going to serve people in the world like our mission is empowering people with access to financial services. And that also becomes even more powerful if you think that globally, there are still billions of people who do not have access to a bank account, right? So for us in, in this part of the world, it's kind of obvious that we have a bank and uh, whether that's a big bank or, or, or FinTech or whatever, it doesn't matter. We have financial services, right? So salaries are being paid uh, electronically right so it, 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 it's being put in your bank for us that's completely normal but there are so many people out there in the world especially in emerging countries and and obviously third world countries if you would call them like that where that's not the case yet so millions and millions probably billions of people do not even have access to financial services so imagine 
that's why the world of financial services is so fantastic. Imagine if you would be able to change that. If, imagine if you would be able to contribute and make that better, which basically means it's not just a bank account, but look at businesses, right? So if you, uh, if you are a farmer in Vietnam and, um, and uh, having access to a bank account with a lending service, right? One of the things we do in our core banking system is lending accounts, lending services, which gives the, a bank or a financial services institute the ability to provide lending money, financial services to, a, for instance, a small farmer. Imagine what it does for, for that person if, if that farmer has access to financial services, which allows him or her to buy machinery to grow crops. And, and, and with that serving, therefore, consumers, 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 the impact part, serving tens of thousands of people and providing them better food or food in the first place. So that is what we do, right? So of course we talk about technology a lot, but that impactful thing is really important. And that bridges to enablement because modern sales enablement for me begins with that element, right? Modern sales enablement begins with, okay, before you do anything, when it comes to knowing what you do, which is also incredibly important, right? I'm not, I'm by no means, I'm, I'm trying to make that less important. But before you start talking about what we do, as in we have fantastic technology and we have a, a, an instrument or a, a feature called composable banking, well, it's more than a feature, it's a vision, which allows banks and financial services to better integrate with their ecosystem, it allows banks and services to actually use, acquire, buy SaaS-based what they actually need and not they don't have to buy everything. It's completely cloud native. So you don't have to worry about putting it in your own data center. You can focus on changing the bank instead of running the bank, right? That's all product-ish, but before you do that, and in sales and sales leadership, you need to work on that principle of, okay, why do we do this? Why, do, why are we in this market? And that, goes, that is basically the founding principle in my, in, my, in my vision of modern sales enablement, not classical sales enablement. And that is also what companies need to do. So we are very adamant. We are very focused on making sure that we stay as close as possible because there's so many other things that pressurize us, right? The numbers, the, the, the shareholders, we have uh, VC rounds. So we have, uh, we have uh, uh, people investing in our company, which is also incredibly important. So we need to serve them as well. But at the same time, you have to stay close to why you were born in the first place. Um, because if you don't, you get a mismatch. It, it becomes disparate and then and that's not a good development for people because at the end of the day, that regardless of the technology you have, and, and we have a fantastic technology platform and, and amazingly talented people who develop the products further, you need to be sure of, do I really feel and believe that what I do with um, serving my customers, helping my customers or the ecosystem or in, and, my, and the customers of my customer with the, the stuff that we do, with the technology that we provide, helping them to do something else again, making money sometimes, running a business, launching a business initiative, in our case, for instance, a new bank or a new fintech or uh, with an existing bank, launch a new product, right? A new financial services product. All that, why are we in this business in the first place? That's modern sales enablement. And that's why I call modern sales enablement from content centric to people centric. So we just have to make sure that we're not just focusing on providing our sales community, which is more than just sales reps. It's, it's inside sales, AEs, uh, BDMs, it's CSMs, customer success managers, solution engineers, advisory consultants, everybody in the sales ecosystem or the community. Serve them, provide them, deliver them content, sales collateral, sales content, customer case stories, training, courses, skill sets, development, anything, but also that mindset motivational thing. Dennis, we're seeing in the in the marketplace at the moment 
when it, especially when it comes to B2B SaaS, we're seeing a hell of a lot of attrition. So we're seeing people quitting their jobs a lot. They've been talk this summer around, they called it the great resignation. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I can speak firsthand around the challenges of hiring talent um, in, this, in the sales function at the moment. You made a point earlier, which, which kind of piqued my, my curiosity around this. You said that perhaps the, the people have got a little bit lost behind the metrics and the spreadsheets. And, you know, I, I wonder whether connecting those dots, you know, do you think that there's a little bit, you know, the, the humans behind the sale have to some extent been forgotten? Um, in the success of a, of a sales function? And, and is that perhaps a, a reason for lots of them leaving their jobs to go and find that growth elsewhere? Um, I would say not perhaps. I would say that that definitely is um, one of the main reasons why people leave their job, why they're so why there's the great resignation uh, happening. And I think the research that has been done has been done in the US only or US and Canada. And uh, one or two other countries, perhaps the UK as well, but it kind of reflects. It's rep uh, it's representing the the, the 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 trend that is that is going on. And and yes, the reason for that is um, well, I wouldn't say lack of leadership, but I would say what as a sales leader and as a leader or as a manager. And there's a distinct difference in both, but let's not go into that for now. Um, you need to be aware of what what do you speak about when you speak with your sales people, when, with your sales teams, right? So what's your narrative? And the funny thing is, it's kind of natural for us as leaders to emphasize over and over again, the importance of hitting your financial targets, right? That's okay, okay-ish. However, making numbers, the centerpiece of your leadership narrative is a costly mistake. Right, you're making a big mistake if you would say the one and only thing or the most important thing I talk about is hitting your financial targets. And it may sound strange because, hey, isn't that what sales is all about? And I would say, no, sales is not all about making money, making numbers, achieving your objectives. That's a result, right? Financial results are an outcome. We need to do other things as leaders to help our salespeople to understand what it is that we're actually doing and why are we doing that? Because if financial results is an outcome, it is definitely not a root or a driver or a reason for employee performance, right? In fact, there is, um, and you see that in the great resignation research, um, that was posted recently. You see, there's, we're beginning to see a lot of evidence and, and research that tells us that the more you focus on financial targets, it kind of, how do you say that? Erodes morale and it definitely undermines long-term strategies. So the leadership narrative that you speak, the language that you use is incredibly important and if you talk as a leader about i want to see behavioral change you need to understand that behavioral change doesn't come from out of nothing it's 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 it happens when you do something else well which is you have to help them build an attitude and that attitude should be okay i'm going to do everything in my power to help my customer be successful whatever it is and if I, would, if I would have that attitude, I can only have that attitude if I think of, okay, why would I have that attitude? So that is fueled by beliefs and, and beliefs are established with helping people to understand why it is that we do these things we do. That's the leadership narrative that you need to talk about. And that's one of the primary reasons why people stay so focused on money because they're forced or they think it's okay to do so. They think they haven't seen it in an, any other way. They haven't been giving a different perspective, which leads to, okay, I can make 20% more when I leave this company, when I go work for somebody else, I can make 20% more. And what you see happening, and I see that almost daily, especially um, uh, the last couple of months, and that's what you refer to as well, uh, they ghost and they go away and they go find somewhere else because 
yeah, it's if you focus on money primarily or only, yeah, it's easy to walk away and say, hey, this is where I can get it better. But you will soon realize that it's never just about the money. It's beautiful to focus on money, but always if you understand that money is an outcome, it's a result. And that's the leadership narrative that we need to build. Yeah, I love that. I um, I quite like thinking about the, the the football analogy. I don't know if you're into sports, Dennis, but the... Ajax, Ajax Amsterdam. Well, there you go. And, you know, you, you think about financial metrics equivalent to like winning championships or winning titles, you know, yeah. there's a lot to be said for investing in the development of the team, building the team towards the goal. But, but very few teams win the titles, you know, only one title can win, only one team can win the league each year, right? So yeah, that's true. But there's a distinct difference between sports, the analogy of sports and performance and, and business and selling. The, in, in sports, it's a finite game. So it stops when you win, right? And, and especially professional sports athletes, regardless of what type of sport, they, they have a strong belief. They are incredibly intrinsically motivated to be the best in their, in their, in their sport, right? So um, Messi is, is a fantastic player. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that he still trains on a daily basis to become even better, right? So there's always a need and always an, an intrinsic need to motivate yourself to become better every day. And that's what we should do in, in, business, in, in the game of business as well, right? Improve, make yourself, help yourself to become better. As a leader, this, your audience is sales leaders, help your people to develop themselves, help your people to focus on that belief and that attitude element. And if you do that, you become better every day, right? Every single day. But the difference with sports is business is it doesn't stop when you win, except for a deal. A deal is finite and then you have a deal. But then, I mean, we're in SaaS. It begins when you close the deal, right? Customer relationships go on way longer than just the deal itself so the deal itself is already old school as well it's really about hey that's when that's when the game begins so now they're going to use the platform okay that's very different so it, it doesn't stop there and uh so it's in in to a certain extent it's also infinite right it doesn't stop and companies don't stop when they win because there's no such thing as winning okay you can achieve your financial objectives but what then then you go on. So um, just like marriage, your marriage doesn't stop because you, yeah, you can't just say, hey, I'm, I'm, I have won. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. So there's a key difference there with the analogy of sports. But some of the principles are, are very much the same. If, if you as a sales leader help your people to, to build an, an incredible powerful belief that, yeah, we're in this business for a, the bigger thing, and then you'll bring in amazing results, right? So what I always say, you don't have to choose between purpose and profit. It coexists. In fact, the profit is better if you focus on these elements of motivation, learning, improving yourself on a daily basis because you're part of something bigger. I love that. I actually had a, a very similar conversation with a sales leader a couple of days ago who was saying he's been in sales his whole career. 25 plus years uh, and he said he's actually he recently had his his kitchen refitted and he said he actually yeah. envied the, the the guy that came around to do his kitchen because that guy finished the job <laughs> <laughs> he said he was. <laughs> and, and for yeah. 25 years as a sales leader i've never finished it's never finished I, you know and it's very much uh, an infinite game that we're playing for for those listening um there's some fantastic content on on Finite uh, and Infinite Games by Naval Ravikant, who is the founder of Angel List, and um, I highly recommend everyone to to check out some of Naval's content on on that. Great, yeah. Dennis, we, we're going to jump now into the final part of the show. We're going to do a quick fire yeah. round, so I'm going to I'm going to throw over some some questions to you, and uh, and really really curious to to see how you respond. Yeah. Cool. Um, first up. What's your favorite sales technology right now? 
Well, um, I do not really have a, a, a favorite platform or, or, or piece of technology that we use in sales. Like everything, it's supposed to be an instrument. It's not, it's not the goal, right? So it's supposed to be an instrument and it helps. So I've, I've experienced with Salesforce from a, let's say, CRM sales um, a process uh, guidance uh, platform. Um, in Oracle, we had Oracle Cloud, Oracle Sales Cloud. There's really not a lot of difference uh, in between. I know our inside sales team in Mambo here, they look at tools like Outreach, uh, which are great. Um, I, I, I'm looking into sales enablement tools, SaaS-based, uh, because until now I have only worked with legacy uh, platforms and legacy tools. Um, I think sales enablement should sales enablement technology should at least cover the most basic things like a centralized content repository, offering sales uh, people the possibility to to read, learn, and share content with their prospects. And it should cover a coaching element. Now, I know UHubs also has a coaching platform for that, so that, that is important. And I believe coaching is something that you, well, if you find the right instrument, you can have, uh, you can improve your coaching capabilities. So if it does that, then it's my favorite, but not necessarily one specific brand or product. I love it. Um, do you have a favorite sales thought leader? at the moment whose content are you really enjoying and learning from right now well that that i can i can only say one thing and that is lisa mcleod because she is my teacher i'm a noble sales purpose uh, a trainer myself i i'm, I'm trained by by her and and uh, by elizabeth Lotardo. they run this company and uh, that she wrote a book a couple of years ago she's a very well-known sales thought leader and leadership um, uh, um, expert as well and uh, yeah, she's my uh, she's my living example, uh, and that's how I see sales. Uh, it's called selling with noble purpose. I would definitely ask or say, check it out. Uh, it's a it's a fantastic book. Uh, and again, I'm 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 a trainer myself on the methodology. It's basically a sales methodology, but then completely customer centric, right? So not the old school sales methodologies where it is. I need to know a lot so that I can see if I can sell something. That's old school. It's completely centered around modern selling, uh, modern leadership, um, uh, and it's called selling with noble purpose. So I would definitely uh, recommend that. And it's totally, she's my ex exemplar and, and, and it's obviously my favorite sales book. Love it. We'll definitely add that to the show notes. We'd love to get Lisa uh, on the show. Yeah, um, she de definitely loves that as well. I know that for a fact. Amazing. Um, Dennis, one tip that you would give your 25 year old self wow i don't even know where to begin but i would say the first thing that comes up is everybody is entitled to their own pace so when you're 25 and you feel like you have no time you're rushing you're hamstering in the treadmill all the time that's that's something that i use in my coaching on a daily basis everybody is especially younger people they're running around doing crazy things because they need to get to get something or get somewhere and and then their their environment says okay yo you need to be a sales manager when you're 31 or you need to be this and that or you need to be global account leader in 2 years and then i say okay everybody is entitled to their own pace so it's your journey it's your path as long as you make sure that you are responsible for that journey and that you understand what it is that you need to do to get there, if it's a specific goal. And if you always look out for, okay, whatever I do in life and in work, I want it to be meaningful, you are entitled to your own pace. I love that. We're all running our own race. Um, and then finally, Dennis, what's your number one wish for the future of, of the sales profession? Well, my number one wish would be that if I would be in a reception or a party or with a group of people and I would ask the question to 10 of them saying, how do you see sales? Because I'm a sales guy. Then I would hope that nine out of the 10 would then say, wow, that's a beautiful profession. That's something that really rocks. Wow, you're a lucky guy that you're in sales because it now is not. Right. It's now where if I would ask 10 people, hey, what do you think about sales? Eight of them would frown their eyebrows and say, sales? Oh, my God, that's horrible. Right. 
that would be my biggest wish that we would build um, that we would build an, 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 a culture or a society, a business society that views sales as something to look up to instead of just putting it away as, oh, these guys, they only, they're only in it for themselves. I think it's a really worthy, worthy vision. Dennis, thanks so much for, for coming on the show today. I could literally spend the rest of the day uh, <laughs> talking with you um, and, and listening to your stories. Um, Dennis, for those listening, where can they find out more um, about you if they have any questions or would like to connect? Yeah, LinkedIn. So connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram as well, Dennis Van Zoost. But LinkedIn is kind of more uh, more uh, active, I would say. And if you want to learn more about purposeful selling, uh, uh, selling and happiness, I, I speak on a, a conference or a web uh, webinar or an event. Um, it's international. Gary Vaynerchuk is one of the speakers as well. So I'm, I'm one of the, the, the key speakers. It's called Celebrate Your Happiness on November 19th. So if you want to join, uh, buy a ticket. It's not expensive. And uh, have a fun day. And I will speak about the, uh, the reasons why modern, what modern sales is and, and, and how you build a, a very productive but also very happy sales culture 19th of november celebrate your happiness amazing we'll also include that in the in the show links um dennis that's that's amazing um thanks so much for your time and uh always enjoy hearing from you and uh learning from your perspectives you're very welcome it was my pleasure thanks matt <laughs>